discussing science is global, which is a very broad statement. And I think it can mean different things to different groups. Uh, for some, it could mean international collaborations or international competitions. Uh, for others, it would be the brain drain. Uh, yet others will think about, uh, I don't know, genomic population studies being extended um, in their focus to patients who are not of European descent so that uh, the results that we're getting are more relevant to everyone um, on the planet. So, of course, we won't be able to cover all of that, uh, uh, but I hope we will touch upon different aspects of the globalization of research, and uh, including the role of diaspora organizations and the role that researchers could play in the global community in the current landscape. Um, so, to start us off, um, can I just get a show of hands if you are a researcher and you have either worked or studied in a country that is not your country of origin? Okay, great, that's quite a few of us. Have you, uh, what about, um, have you collaborated or worked with someone from another country that is not your own country? Okay, uh, great, thank you, it's quite a few of us. Um, so, I guess that's why I think this subject is so fascinating because on one hand it is something very broad and on the other hand it is affecting the everyday lives of most of researchers, at, if not globally, then at least in this room. Um, so, um, it's also something that is very dynamic and uh, forever changing. So, um, with this in mind, I'd like to start by asking our panelists, what, in your opinion, are the current uh, trends or maybe highlights um, or um, challenges in the globalization of science? And actually, I'll stop now. I just remembered because um, we have two people uh, from organizations. I was wondering if you could also include a little bit um, let's do it one by one. If uh, we can just start, Laura, would you like to give us a, a bit of a rundown about the, the Royal Society? Okay. Thank you. All right, okay, so this works. Um, so hello everyone, um, thank you very much for inviting me here this evening. Um, I don't know how many of you know about the Royal Society, but uh, the Society is the UK's National Academy of Sciences. Uh, we are a fellowship of over 1,600 of the world's most eminent scientists. And the key point here is it's an international fellowship. So the society has been in existence since 1660, and its international work is really a bedrock of uh, the organization as a whole. So not only do we support researchers around the world, we foster international collaborations. We have a number of grant schemes that are open to all researchers, including Polish researchers, so I'd encourage you to have a look. Um, we also are a publisher. Um, we publish the world's first peer review journal, and that includes input uh, from scientists all around the world. We also uh, have a science policy part of our organization that provides policy advice to UK and international governments. Um, and we also have a role, importantly, um, in inspiring the public about science. So not only scientific audiences, but um, explaining the role of science to the public. And then where I work, um, obviously, is looking at our international relations, the work we do with academies around the world, um, and also working with governments uh, around the world to talk about scientific issues and ensure that science is an important part of the policymaking process. So as we've been around since 1660, um, you'll find that international work, I mean, something we always talk about is that we have a vice president and a foreign secretary, uh, someone who's been doing that role since very early on in the society's history. So it was very well recognized that engagement with scientists around the world was an important part of uh, scientific collaboration. We also, so I, I suppose my point here is that science is global, but then it always has been global um, <laughs> and it continues uh, to be global. And we've done a lot of work, unsurprisingly, looking at the ways in which researchers move around the world, um, the sorts of things that motivate them um, to build their careers. And it's a really important part of the scientific career. You can uh, meet someone who works in a different country and realize that there's a lot you can learn from each other, but also uh, it can start the beginning of different scientific collaborations. Um, a good example of this is the president of the Royal Society is Venki Ramakrishnan. Um, Venki was born in India. He pursued his career in the US and then he came to the UK. And you see this trend 
um, amongst so many of the scientists we work in, we work with. Um, one thing before I let others speak, um, you also see the role that science plays. Um, I'd say it's really a link between people despite political difficulties. There's countless examples, again, throughout our um, more than 350 year history of scientists working to collaborate despite political difficulties. And I think that's really important. I think it can offer an opportunity to continue to um, keep channels of communication open and to enable scientific links to really be built. Thank you. This is my turn. Okay, so um, I'm here representing the Society of Spanish Researchers in the United Kingdom. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. Um, and well, not much to say because we are, I think, a very similar um, group, um, that um, Polonium Foundation. So we are uh, seven years old. We established ourselves in 2012. We have 700 members at the, at the moment, but we only represent Spanish researchers in the United Kingdom. Um, that, that's a difference that, that we have uh, with the um, Polonian Foundation. Um, but we are part of RAIFEX, which is an international consortium of all Spanish diaspora in the world. So this is um, 16 different organizations in all around the world. And we all together conform RAIFEX. And I think that that will be the more direct, um, uh, the more direct association that makes more sense with um, Polonium, but just uh, so you know. So we have four uh, main objectives as a society. So we want to act as a social network for all Spanish researchers that come to the UK. We also act as science communicator. We want to communicate the science that our uh, members do, uh, both to the UK uh, community, but also to the Spanish community. We also act as science mediators. So we are, especially um, during current political landscape, we are um, doing a lot of work in trying to establish and strengthen current um, bilateral collaborations between Spain and the, and the UK. We are offering mobility fellowships to early career researchers and um, postdocs so they can either come to the UK and, and, and be here for six months or go to Spain um, and, yeah, and, and spend more or less the same, the same uh, time in a university so we can uh, help establishing those new relationship moving forward. Um, and lately we uh, want to act as science representative both in the UK and Spain. I think that we are in a very special uh, situation uh, being uh, the Spanish diaspora here in the, in the UK. The UK being such a strong um, country in what in um, research and innovation um, policy and research and innovation um, landscape. So we ha we are in a very special um, position to uh, come back to our own country and let them know what works and what doesn't work. And we've been doing also a lot of. Um, representation work in, the, in this sense, uh, advising um, different organizations, uh, learn societies, and even the government in Spain, so we can all learn from uh, our experiences. Um, yeah, I think that, that that would be me. Great, thank you. Um, hello, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. It's wonderful to have the time slot when everybody's fresh after a leisurely seven hours of uh, listening to fascinating talks today. I'm very proud to be wearing my Science Polish Perspective socks uh, already, uh, so put yours on, they're very comfortable. Um, to talk about some trends in uh, globalization of research, well, I'm going to concentrate on the, the humanities, to some extent, social sciences, because those are the areas with which I'm familiar. Um, and I think the trend is quite simple, which is that there's more and more emphasis on it and more and more pressure on researchers to engage in uh, various forms of international cooperation, um, sometimes uh, against their will, uh, particularly for scholars 
is, is the microphone working or is it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Particularly for scholars in the humanities who may not be as used to working in teams um, as, as scholars in, in various fields in STEM where there's simply no other way uh, to do work. And that's an interesting dimension to the globalization of research in the humanities as well, is what we really see is the imposition of a model uh, that really comes from STEM subjects um, onto the humanities, which creates various challenges. So I'm, I'm interested in what they are and I'm interested in what the actual value in international cooperation is in humanities areas. I think there is a significant value in some areas, but I'm not sure that it's always been exploited in the way that grant opportunities are actually pursued and the way in which researchers are actually encouraged to take up grant opportunities. Very briefly, uh, to conclude uh, these opening remarks, um, I'm interested in Poland and the UK. Those are the, con the countries that I'm uh, engaged with. So very briefly on what the trends are in those two countries. What's the direction of movement with respect to globalization of research or internationalization of research? Well, we are approaching a crossroads uh, in this country for obvious reasons. And I'm sorry to already bring Brexit into the discussion. Seven uh, minutes. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but uh, clearly, th th this what if we're talking about a trend, in, we, we see a country that's extremely globalized uh, in its research landscape, has been extremely successful, and particularly at institutions like this one, um, at attracting various kinds of funding for international research projects. And obviously, we're moving into a phase of uncertainty as to exactly what is going to happen next and what will be the arrangements that we will have with the various European funding programs. Um, obviously, British universities were uh, by, against Brexit. It's not in the interests of British research. It's not in the interests of British universities. But this is the reality that we're going to face. So that's interesting. Well, what, what is that going to mean? Um, uh, it's, it's going to create some obstacles. There'll be a ways around those obstacles, I'm sure. But that, those are really interesting questions. With Poland, we see a very strong aspiration towards internationalization and globalization, but a very low level of achievement to this point in time. So that also interests me greatly because I, I have a personal uh, and professional interest in, in that, that level um, rising um, in the near future. I don't see any reason why that shouldn't happen, why that shouldn't be possible. I also believe that the people in this room, and we'll talk about this later, are crucial um, in the realization uh, of, of those plans. Um, but I'm particularly interested, and we'll get into those details later on, what the particular obstacles are or what they have been. Uh, and unfortunately, I think we see that uh, the, the way that the, ref the reforms that we've just seen in Poland um, in, educa in higher education, which have some positive dimensions, um, are not necessarily uh, going to um, contribute to great strides um, in internationalization of Polish universities or research, as far as I can tell at this point. But it'll be interesting to talk about that. I'd like to get into those details later on. I think that's more than enough to start with, and I'll pass the microphone on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me again. Um, so it's, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, so I'm in genetics. Um, um, that's what my research group is doing. And I think genetics, genomics fields has really been one of the very successful stories of um, working globally. I'm not going to say globalization, don't particularly like that word, but working collaboratively, working globally, joining forces. And this is really started with the human genome uh, project where we saw what happens when we join forces across different institutes and, and how that accelerates um, um, well, genetics at that point, uh, building a human uh, genome map, and then through joining forces on building large cohorts of um, pa cohorts of patients and, and healthy controls, so we could start to study uh, what are the genetic predispositions underlying many complex diseases that haven't been really possible to map until we started looking at thousands of uh, or hundreds of thousands of patients, which only has been possible because we were able to collaborate uh, together to build this kind of cohorts. So, um, and, and I mean, it just keeps going, it, it goes on and on and on, and we're currently at the 
point where we are uh, sequencing, doing whole genome sequencing of half a million uh, UK biobank individuals. And um, I think what's particularly interesting is the, the, the sort of a part of global science is that this data becomes available to a large community. And I think this is really remarkable because this accelerates the progress uh, at, a, at the scale, at the rate that is just simply not possible if a, a host institute was the only one to be fully analyzing the data and not sharing it with anybody. And I mean, there's just endless examples of how uh, wonderful uh, these collaborations are, and, and at the end of the day, they're really benefiting uh, patients. Um, so I think in terms of the genomics field, I, I mean, the global science there is um, throughout, all the way through, from joining forces to collaborate, from exchanging um, uh, students and, 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 and expertise across the globe. Um, I think what's also currently becoming a really important issue and, and widely discussed and, and more and more funding is becoming available is that we've realized that we've studied um, white Caucasian population quite well, and, and we, um, we don't really learn that much anymore from it. And there's a big value in uh, studying um, other populations. And so there's a lot of funding now going into um, uh, genetic research in, in populations in Africa, in isolated populations where we can, where we have much more power to detect many disease associations. And I'm really pleased to see that, uh, that this is happening. Happening. So, um, and and I guess I'll, I'll close with a slightly different um, um, global science um, uh, take, which is uh, actually today the Sanger Institute uh, um, had the kickoff of the uh, the Darwin Tree of Life, which is a global science in the sense that they're starting off by sequencing um, all the. Uh, life, all the species at the British Isles, with the ultimate goal to actually sequence all the living life on the planet. Um, and that's pretty global. I don't think it can go more global than that. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I think it's interesting to see that um, each of you, in a slightly different aspect, have mentioned the, the strengths that we see in the UK when it comes to um, attracting people from different backgrounds and being very good at supporting collaborations. But I quite like what you mentioned, Rocio, about uh, things that work and things that don't work. So I would just like um, to see if we can get into a bit more detail whether um, any of you have comments about what has been working well or maybe what has been not working so well, either in the UK or maybe in other countries where we have some space to learn from, from the examples here. So um, that's a very interesting uh, question that actually I think that something that you said also made me think about it because you were talking about internationalization of the system, right? And, but we are talking also about globalization of the science. So from my point of view, they are two different things, but one cannot happen without the other, right? So I think that one of the um, major strengths of the UK system is how international it is and how um, good it is at attracting talent. And it's attracting talent, not attracting uh, people or retaining, because for example, um, when I talk to people in Spain, they are very worried about all the Spanish people that are um, abroad. and uh, What we can do to try and bring, um, and, and, and bring them home. Right? And it's like, you don't need to bring Spanish people home. You need to be able to attract talent. And if that talent is Spanish, that's great. If that talent is not Spanish, that's good as well. You know? So I think that that's one of the main things that the UK does really, really well. So they are, we are, <laughs> we, because we are part of the system. We are able to attract very, very good people, no matter where they are. And not only attracting them, but they want to stay, so and that's also very good because if you are able to attract someone, but then they you are not able to retain that talent. That's bad for everybody. It's bad for the individual. It's bad for the country. It's bad for the system. So um, yeah, I think that that's um, 
something that the UK does very well and that in the future in really needs to keep doing it very well because I don't think that any system, no matter how mature it is and how strong it is, without people, it's not going anywhere. So um, that's, that's my take. <laughs> Can I add something? So that, that's really useful and I think really important what you said and, and I think that's one of the challenges that Britain faces now is that firstly, well, administratively uh, to some extent, but also just as the symbolism of the whole Brexit process mm -hmm. um, is, is putting out a kind of message that makes people potentially feel less welcome here, right, which makes uh, the talent that we want to bring here uh, feel less welcome and therefore uh, think more carefully about what other options there might be, be they North American options, which are, uh, you know, in, in certain ways more attractive than this country anyway, uh, for various reasons. Uh, so, so I think that that dimension is very, is very significant and we can, we're creating unnecessary barriers and we need to think about the ways we get around that, the ways that universities continue to present themselves. And obviously cities are part of the solution to this, the way that London is presenting itself now within the context of Brexit Britain um, is, is very much uh, in, in the sense that we're still an open city and an open place. Um, well, now if I jump over to Polish politics, um, the same thing applies. Uh, if you have a politics which is emphasizing aspects of clo being closed, so a Polish politician today who on international television said, we don't want to be taken over by Muslims or Buddhists, uh, who or whoever they might be. His name was Dominik Tarczynski for the Poles among you, you know who he is. Um, or if you're putting out a message of a sort of witch hunt against um, gays and lesbians, um, then that does not on a political level, that does not put out um, a message of being open to talent, to put it in your uh, rather transactional way, but obviously that's the way we think about it. That is not the message to put out there. And it makes a difference. It's that soft aspect, particularly if you're a country like Poland that is aspiring for its system to get on the map where it's not now, and every little advantage that can be gained makes a difference. Um, if a researcher is thinking, do I collaborate with the Estonians or with the Poles, and then they get the sense that one country is a more open or interesting place than the other, then that soft uh, aspect could actually make a difference. You know, if I think about student exchanges, um, I have gay and lesbian students. Um, would I send them to Poland? Now I would, because I think it's still safe there. But if it keeps moving in that direction, does it get less safe? Does a point get reached where I think about whether I would uh, suggest to a gay and lesbian student that Poland's a good place to go? These are painful questions to ask, but I think in Poland's position, those political questions of a symbolism uh, are actually very important, right? And, and, the, and openness to talent, as you describe, and openness to the world that's the topic of our discussion. So, and again, to emphasize, I'm not just talking about Poland. Obviously, the phase that we're in in Britain um, is, is uh, just as bad <laughs> uh, with respect to the message that, that we have been putting out symbolically to the world because of the decision um, that we have made. Um, I think we need to think about how we get around those things and, and similarly uh, in Poland. Thank you. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I guess I'm just thinking maybe just to add to what you said because there's really not much I can, nothing that I can disagree with, is the um, first kind of experience where some of my excellent colleagues and, and some of the top world researchers, um, and we're talking about group leaders, not students anymore even, are consciously deciding to move their research into a country that is more stable, like for example, Germany, where this, like we, we all have to fight for funding and for attracting good students, and it's not a easy job, but we're there for science. And, and I've just seen really many uh, exceptionally good colleagues who moved to Amsterdam, moved to Germany because of the current situation. Um, so it's um, yeah, it's it's not only for students really that I mean we we I know exactly from the number of applications that I get now how many less I get from Europe um, and it just yeah it's, it it forces me to more actively reach out to people so any prospective PhD students or postdocs uh, you know you know how to find me. Um, 
And, um, and I try to, I think, not to make it too depressing on me. I, I, I keep on telling everybody that I don't want to move because I get the front seat to watch Brexit. So why would I? <laughs> Thank you. And um, I think, so, you know, a lot of people have talked about how international the UK science base is and how international the UK science system is. And I think it's a really important point to reiterate this idea of the importance of being open, of being welcoming, because I think we, we have to tackle quite a lot of issues of perception here. So, you know, what is the current uh, situation and what impact that will have on research? Uh, encouraging and making it clear that UK researchers, uh, you know, obviously still want to be um, involved, able to collaborate with international partners and ensuring that we can uh, do what we can to continue that. From the Royal Society's perspective, we've been working on three specific uh, areas since even before the referendum. And the key one to bring up here is the mobility and collaboration point. We've just talked about how important international uh, well, how, how science is international, how science is global, but you have to think about what you can do to ensure that that does remain the case. And I think tackling this perception point is, is, a, is a really important part to think the UK is an open and welcoming environment. We really want to ensure that it stays that way because that's a big part of why people feel comfortable in be a, being able to come here and pursue their careers. Thank you. Um, we are leaning um, towards the B word, Brexit, uh, quite hard. So I'm just going to take us away from that just for a second, because I'm pretty sure we'll come back to that. And um, also, it would, it would be a boring panel if we all just agree on the same things, which is the risk here. So I'm going to ask a slightly different question, and then we might, uh, I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um, thinking about kind of global science and global stories, global challenges. Um, I don't know, such as tackling the climate change and um, or um, anti antibiotic resistance or um, I don't know, looking for sources of alternative energy. You know, these are the big themes that can uh, obviously attract very big consortia and a lot of money and uh, lots of teams collaborating across different countries, across different areas. But um, I was wondering if you have any comments um, about what are the risks of more local stories getting lost in that, either in the funding landscape or just in, in the research, whether, um, I don't know, if there is a small community next to Womja, which is a town in Poland, or uh, I don't know, some local ecosystems that might not be studied or might not be taken you know, into a closer look, or they're not deemed as attractive to funding. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I guess from humanities perspectives, I was also thinking when it comes to languages or endemics. So. Go ahead. I'll go ahead. Oh. Okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that this is where science policy comes into mm -hmm. place. Um, there needs to be always a balance between top-down and bottom-up kind of research, always. Um, we, at, at healthy research and innovation system, cannot thrive if everything is challenge oriented, to put it that way, right? And a lot of countries are moving that way because money is tight and um, it's, it sells a lot better saying that you are investing 10 million pounds in tackling cancer or in tackling um, climate change than saying that, I don't know, you're studying a random protein that you don't know what, what's doing, for example. So, um, yeah, basically I do think that even when money is tight, um, there needs to be a commitment from uh, funding bodies and government to maintain, I'm not gonna say basic science because that's not what we mean, but to maintain bottom-up approaches to funding. So if you wanna study a super niche, something that only you and your collaborators are doing, and you think it's important, and the reviewers think it's important. Even if whoever is in number 10 at the moment doesn't think it's important, it's gonna get funded, and you're gonna be able to 
pursue that, that, that research. Obviously, challenge-oriented and, and global challenges and all that kind of research is massive. It's very important. We need to do it, but not um, in detriment of all the other science that, at the end of the day, is what maintains an, a system living and, th and thriving and what pays like 90% of all salaries in the, in, the, in the UK because not that many people are actually doing that, that global challenge stuff. So what I would say is that we need to understand the role of, of these two kind of um, funding um, opportunities and, and, yeah, and funding bodies need to under, understand that very well, I think, mm. and, and support that kind of research with like all the effort, I think, is, is, is massively important. Yeah. Thank you for the question, which I think is a very interesting one, particularly in the Polish context, because there are burning debates right now um, in Poland, particularly in the humanities, about this uh, perceived conflict between internationalization of research and research on Poland. Um, so on Polish history, on Polish literature, on Polish culture. Um, so particularly around this new reform, uh, in which there's an emphasis on publishing in international journals, there's an emphasis on international cooperation, in which I would strongly support. I think that's a good uh, aspect of this reform. Um, but there's a lot of pushback within the humanities in particular from people who say, well, how are we supposed to publish in an international journal uh, our uh, discussions about the 16th century poet Jan Kochanowski, um, uh, who is not well known uh, abroad, or how are we supposed to publish our research on the small community near Womja and its history. Um, and therefore, they uh, say that they are disadvantaged by a system that emphasizes international mm -hmm. publications over local. Um, look, I, I think it's an interesting discussion. Um, I think, however, that there is actually a way of doing both. Um, and I think there are two ways uh, of doing both. Uh, first of all, I think it is absolutely important for Polish researchers to be publishing in international journals even when they are writing about the little community near Womja, or when they're writing about Jan Kohanowski, and I don't see any reason why those subjects can't be, if they're framed in the right way, interesting to other researchers in other parts of the world. It's a question of showing how the Polish case sheds light on the global questions that many uh, people are dealing with. I don't see any reason why that's not uh, doable. However, I also understand that if you're getting into the sort of arcana of uh, Polish literature, which is my field, for example, and the particular debates on, uh, on, on, uh, on very sort of specific subjects, those kinds of debates still should go on, and they might be better to be going on on the pages of Polish journals and therefore some kind of appropriate valuation for research that's published in Polish in Polish journals um, and that focuses really on specificity that would be hard to convey to an international audience and there are some areas like that to have ways of valuing that kind of research as well uh, I think is important but I don't see why those two aims shouldn't be mutually uh, exclusive um, but it is a very uh, sort of important discussion that's going on in Poland particularly in the humanities um, and social sciences uh, today and I'm sure not only in Poland. Um, I'm just going to add to it. Um, from the perspective of genetic field, genetic field, I think actually that we're at the point where um, maybe smaller communities are actually starting to finally benefit a little bit from this research because you can imagine a consortium that is put together to study the genetic, uh, genetics of uh, people of the Greek Isles. And you have small number of individuals at these islands, and um, they're all very precious. They have very different genetic uh, uh, makeup. And if you were a researcher uh, trying to get serious funding, say, for doing whole genome sequencing on those individuals for this particular island, it could be difficult to get that funding. But if you can team up with other uh, people across the different um, who are interested in studying genetic makeup of people from the other islands, I think your chances are much greater than to build a strong case that this is important. And now we also really have appreciation that it is important to get into um, isolated populations and really look more into genetic diversity because there's a lot we can, lot more we can learn from uh, those individuals than we can from, say, Western Europeans. Um, there is, of course, the risk there 
and I think that's where uh, many people maybe are not as willing to participate, is that you sort of get lost if you care for your authorship, uh, which you might because that is important for your um, academic career and then raising funding and so on. But this big cons consortia often tend to sort of dilute the um, individual contribution. So there's definitely that as a downside to this kind of research. But in terms of the person who might benefit from it, which is the individuals, the people who actually get sequenced, and hopefully some, some of that sequence data is translated to uh, new medicine or, 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 or impacts their life um, in a beneficial other way. Um, I, I think then, then globalizing um, or, or conducting research global, globally actually brings in opportunities and more funding to, to um, communities or uh, yeah, uh, cases that maybe would have been more difficult to fund if they were to make an individual uh, case. Thank you. Um, it's interesting how, um, paradoxically, there can be um, parallels drawn even between genetics and humanities in the kind of final global and local aspects. Thank you. Um, I think we're nearing to halfway through um, our time here, so uh, I would like to hand over our questions to the audience very briefly, uh, very soon. But before I do that, uh, because we are discussing um, something that touches the lives of many people here, and um, we have in the audience quite a few researchers at different stages in their lives, maybe uh, working outside of their home country or thinking about their next career steps. I was wondering if you had any advice that uh, you would give to people who are thinking about um, their careers, what to do next, either um, in, in your own area or a bit more broadly. Um. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not a practicing scientist, so the advice I'm going to give you is advice I'd give to um, anyone, really. But um, I would just say be ambitious. There are so many opportunities out there at the moment for scientists who want to not only move around the world, but I think there are lots of opportunities to um, think across disciplines, to think... Uh, we talked, we were just talking a little bit about this. Um, lots of opportunities to open up your research and make the most of opportunities like this, make the most of opportunities to um, meet people a little bit outside of your space and it may open your world even more. Thank you. Hopefully that's what's been going on in this <laughs> event with people from different disciplines. Thanks. Well, I'm not a practicing scientist either, but um, from my experience, what I will say is that don't be afraid of doing things that maybe are not directly linked to your research, um, because you never know where things are going to lead you. So if you're interested in something, even though it's completely different or it's completely outside your discipline or your main um, research topic, but you want to do it, you have the time and your mental health will allow it, I, I will suggest you do it. Because um, I can say that my, my career has benefited a lot from doing things that were not directly involved with the research that I was doing like four years ago. Um, so yeah, that's basically maybe my, my, my advice. I'm gonna have two, they'll be very short. Uh, so the banal one, do what you're interested in. You'll always be better at it. So you'll always achieve more in an area that you're just so passionate about that you're going to go to that extra, ex uh, go that extra mile to put the work into it. Um, so don't be too strategic sometimes. Obviously you need to in some circumstances, but as much as possible to do the thing that you're actually passionate about. And the second would be to quote the founder of the Polish Student Association in the UK, Zbigniew Pelczyński, and his motto, Always connect, Zawsze Wanchich. Every opportunity you have to connect with other people who are doing other things, take advantage of it because so many surprising things come out. And you're obviously all here, so you're obviously the kinds of people who would take that message seriously. But you often be just surprised by what can come out of a chance connection with somebody who's in a completely different field for your, with your, to yours, to always be open to those connections with other people who are doing very different things and their ideas. All right, so that's all three points that I really wanted to make. <laughs> um, 
I, I mean, networking is obviously, you, you just, just do it. And then I think I'll add to it, make sure you capitalize on it. So if you're at the point where you're like thinking, oh, what should I do next? I met that person, I'm, I'm looking, maybe I'm not gonna connect them. Just, just shoot them an email or, or reach out to your own mentor or your person and say, you know, I'm thinking, can you connect me? Like really not just network for the sake of networking, use your network um, and be reciprocal to, to return the favor. Um, and, and I'm gonna um, also sort of echo the, um, the curiosity and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and doing something that maybe not is not what you would uh, naturally do. And, and I, have, uh, I have a personal experience and, and I sort of feel like I would keep on doing that and every five years I'm ending in doing something that is not entirely comfortable. Um, but I think that's how we advance and how we progress. But I have a great story, um, and I'm going to say it be, so that it syncs with you. And, and when next time you have an opportunity and you're thinking, maybe I should do this project that is really completely different to what I'm doing now, but I'd like to try it. Maybe something's going to come out of it, but should I? I don't know. There was a student who joined my group, actually Polish as well, for a year. Um, and when she arrived to the lab, she said, I, I, I gave her a project to do some more um, um, computational projects. She was like, I really don't like it. I'm not good with computers and I don't have a good background with it. I was like, it's okay, we're a computational group, we'll teach. She's like, no, I don't think this is something I wanna do. And, and she sort of put it in her head that this isn't something she wants to do. Um, so we shifted her to the lab. She was excellent in the lab, really great. And then, unfortunately, she had a bike accident in Cambridge and broke her arm in 14 places. Um, and she couldn't go to the lab anymore. But she was like, I still want to do something. I want to be connected with the research you guys are doing. And I don't want to just sit with my arm not functional. I was like, well, we've got a computational project if you want. <laughs> um, and she picked up so well, and she got so into it, and started coding. And I remember, I think the most satisfying moment to me was when she didn't show up for a seminar that we had, and I was like, where everybody's supposed to attend those seminars? Gosha, her name was also Gosha. Where were you? It's like, I'm so sorry, I was coding until 5 a.m. and I fell asleep and I overslept. It's like, yes. <laughs> and currently she's doing PhD in um, computational project analyzing single cell data. And so it just, if, if anything, I hope this sinks in with you. Don't be afraid that there's something you, you know, you don't feel like you have, or somebody told you you're not good at something, but you're kind of curious. Just go and do it and try it. And if it doesn't work, you just learn a skill and you know you're not gonna like it. So no point, you know, regretting not doing something. Great, thank you. That's um, really encouraging and um, quite inspiring. I think on this, more uplifted note. I would like to open the floor uh, to questions. Unfortunately, we only have two of these mobile mics, so we're going to have to share one with the audience, if that's okay. And we'll just keep one here. Yeah, we are all about collaborations. Exactly, we'll make it work. Unless you want to try that small one, but I hopefully, yeah. So, um, if I could just ask before you ask your question, if you could state um, your name and your affiliation, as in the previous sessions. Nastasia Laskowski from University of Cambridge. Um, there was recently some media coverage about Matt Hancock's ambitions to sequence every baby in the UK. And so it's a genomic specific question about whether you personally think this is a good allocation of resources. Say, say again, what, what? Um, Matt Hancock's ambitions to sequence every baby in the UK, uh, ultimately uh, in the future, whole genome sequencing. Oh. Just, just, just for sequencing? Just yeah, like whether predictive he, medicine? Well, so he didn't really specify what the end goal was. And uh, I'm from the genomic medicine MPhil, and we were just discussing whether this would be a, a very practical allocation of resources, considering that we don't know that much about yeah, the genome. Yeah, I was about to say that. We, don't, we can't really do much with it. I mean, it does make sense when there's a family history, for example, or when there's certain risk, then absolutely it makes sense to, to sequence. But sequencing for the sake of sequencing, I mean, for majority of these things, we have no idea how to interpret them. And, and we're working hard to figure it out, but it will take a little bit longer until we can, um, yeah. 
I was wondering whether you think that having such a large biobank would help research, though, um, or whether it's still not a good... It's already helping tremendously, yeah. yes. And, and that's only from the... Um, uh, well, a few base pairs that we've... Uh, a few points in the genome that we sort of uh, mapped, what we read from those individuals. And currently we're doing whole genome sequencing. I think it will be a tremendous research. We're, we're learning a ton out of it, really, including how complex it is and how easy it is to find something. And then, you know, what? how do we make sense out of those findings? Because many of those... Um, Many of, our, of the findings correlate with very complex um, traits, phenotypes, um, so it's not straightforward. But um, yeah, I can't wait. This is great. I don't do that analysis, but I'm always interested in the findings, and then we think about what to do with the findings. There's one over there. Um, hi, I'm Magda. I'm doing a DPhil at the University of Oxford. And so recently there, there was a lot of discussion, and there still is, um, that the, also genomic data, but also all the medical research, uh, all the participants in, in the clinical trials and the research, they usually are, 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 are white and they're in the very developed countries. And a, a lot of research is done also on on males, not females, and that there is strong bias uh, that is uh, th that, that just puts females and people from other countries, uh, other ethnic groups, at uh, worse positions. And I was wondering how to, what, what's the best way to approach that to to make the, the science more equal, so people from from less developed countries where there is less research, so they can benefit from uh, from what we do in in the UK or in the States or other European countries. Mm. I, I take that. Um, uh, <laughs> unless anybody else wants to. Yeah, yeah, go. <laughs> um, I think that's already changing. For example, the, um, the funding agencies, and that's a really great incentive. Um, they say, you know, how is, what's your distribution of gender? And if it's not equal, what's the justification for the gender not being equal? Um, very often now there are calls also where they specifically ask uh, how are you taking in into account underrepresented minorities, ethnicities, and, and specifically addressing that. So there's really more and more focus on um, addressing those issues because, yeah, we've been neglecting them. But I mean, to be fair also, you know, there. There are, there's infrastructure and resources, and sometimes for a proof of, proof of concept studies, it's just much easier to get, if there's already a biobank, for example, right? It's easier to sequence half a million individuals from, uh, from the UK for whom we have great phenotyping rather than start now collecting the data somewhere else. I mean, we should be doing that. Um, but it's just sometimes it's just the practicality that there are resources to do a very large scale, very informative project that's going to benefit the whole world to some extent and some populations more than the others, unfortunately. But I think there is a push and I think that the community is really, uh, I just came back from American Society of Human Genetics. And, and we explicitly talk about it, and, and there really is more and more understanding, and there's more people willing to uh, fund research projects that are not necessarily on uh, white Western Europeans. Um, Laura, I don't know, it feels like maybe the Royal Society has, uh, even in your role, the collaborations in international research. Uh, would you like to comment? Or, sorry to put you no, on No, don't worry. I mean, uh, there's, there's one specific thing I will mention, actually, um, which is an international commission on human genome editing, which is um, currently happening at the moment. The Royal Society is working with the National Academy of Sciences in the US on this commission. But again, it obviously draws scientists from throughout the world because as we've said, this is the sort of um, issue that you cannot really work on in isolation. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. But <laughs> um, and so I think we're working in terms of um, academies on this issue and recognizing the importance of working together. The commission is actually meeting next week um, in the UK. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing uh, what they'll be working on and what they'll be recommending. 
just add that this is a particularly interesting example because different countries have different regulations on editing humans. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um. Sure. Um, hi, Joanna Bogniewska, Universities of um, Oxford and Reading, and I don't have a genetics question, um, um, but I do. I do have a um, question about how we speak about um, global co uh, cooperations and uh, and mobility being great for science, but what about scientists? Is it good for scientists? I mean. Uh, you've got families in Australia, in Spain, in Poland. What will happen when your parents get old and they need care? What will happen when your kids want to go and travel somewhere else? What happens with your partners? Uh, are these? What do you think your predictions might be? Because uh, it seems like in today's world, there's so much pressure on scientists to go and travel as much as possible. But the system that has been created um, decades ago uh, was created for, uh, well, let's be honest, men who had wives who, who would look after them and who could be uprooted and moved somewhere else. But this is not the society we live in today. And I know this is a difficult question, but I was wondering if maybe you have any tips on uh, how you've dealt with it or you've seen others deal with it. Thank you. I think that's a great question. And actually, I was just listening to the new, uh, 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 the youngest Nobel laureate in economics. What's her, is it Duflo? I think she's French-American. Um, and she is challenging, and she's just won the Nobel for this, she's challenging the received logic of, of economists that people will just move and that the logic of the market will dictate that people will want to move. She's saying precisely what you're suggesting, that people are sticky, <laughs> that people are sort of stuck to places more than the, that law of uh, just they'll go where the opportunities are um, suggests. And she is proposing a new model. Duflo, I think, is the surname. Is, uh, I'm not an economist. Um, she's proposing a new model of economics that would take that into account and that would, and that would suggest that you have to invest in regions, not just in people. Again, against the, the, the economic um, orthodoxy uh, on the basis that, and look, this is very relevant in the European Union, where we've seen a sort of massive increase of mo mobility um, for obvious reasons, um, and that has meant a flow of people from, uh, well, from Poland, for example, to this uh, country, and there are other parts of the European Union that have been affected even more dramatically than Poland, and that has knock-on effects um, in those places. I think it's a really, really important question um, that you're that you're raising here, um, and about it's to do with families as well, and and uh, and absolutely gender dynamics, um, really important um, in all of this. I don't have an answer. I just wanted to say to you that this is something that people are thinking about at the cutting edge right now um, in economics. Um, I, I also think it's a fascinating question, and I think um, there are a few things I can point to that the Royal Society is looking at and taking these sorts of questions really seriously. So not only thinking about why people move, I mentioned a piece of work we've done to think about you know, when researchers move in their career, what motivates them. Quite interesting that when you have a family, decisions around where you might move, how and why, what infrastructure you might need, where you're moving actually becomes a consideration it may not have been in a different part of your career. But also looking at this idea of, which I think you're touching on a little bit, about what kind of system really needs to be in place to support scientists and how inclusive science can therefore be. So the Royal Society um, has a team that works on diversity issues, and that's diversity in you know uh, touching a lot of different areas. We've uh, produced a piece of work called Parent Care a Scientist, which looks exactly at this. So practical real life examples of scientists who have different uh, different considerations throughout their career, whether they become parents, whether they become a carer for their parents, um, and what is needed to ensure that they can still pursue their career as a scientist. Because that's quite an important message to get across, um, that you may have many things that you're dealing with in your life that doesn't stop you from pursuing a career in science. 
Um, and then finally, a piece of work that we're looking at on research culture. And this is a really big question. So what will the research system look like in 2030? What will researchers need to be able to support their work, to be able to ensure that their own um, careers can flourish? And that encapsulates funding, but it also looks at different kinds of policies to support different people in the scientific workforce. So we are thinking about this. This is not a question I think that you have an answer to just like that. Um, but it, it's, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah, I'm going to add something because and it's going to be a bit of a rant, I'm afraid. <laughs> because I think that um, Poland and Spain has, have some similar issues regarding this particular problem, right? And for me, it all like, boils down to choice is why people move, but also why people stay where they are. Because for example, I moved to this country by choice. I wanted to come here. But if you ask me now why I'm still here, is probably because, and I'm being 100% like, like sincere here, it's, like, it's because I don't see a way of living that uh, makes me 100% happy. So that doesn't mean that I want to stay here. It means that I cannot live. <laughs> I mean, that is not true either, because I'm not unhappy. I'm happy here. And I know that a lot of people that are here, even though it's not their favorite country to be, are happy still. But we don't see a way of, of, of living and maintaining our quality of life, our professional uh, prospectus as well, you know? So obviously, it's choice. I am prioritizing my professional life rather than my being close to my family, for example. No? So, um, yeah, and I think that this is, as I said at the beginning, this is very country specific, so some other immigrants don't have this issue because they have a more supportive system back in their country, right? So it depends where you're from and what it is that you do for work and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, so I'm sorry about the negative uh, answer, but yeah, 100%. This is something that we are also working uh, in SRUK as well to understand why our members are here, why do they stay here, for how long do they stay, do they want to come back, do they want to go to another country, so all that kind of stuff. And I think that is something that all diasporas share. Um, reasons. Uh, are different, and reasons why we stay in the country are also very, very different. But yes, so very good questions as well. Can I just say, as we pass it down, the economist's name is Esther Duflo. I just checked it <laughs> other, on the telephone, so I was. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what did I want to say? I uh, wanted to add. Here's an interesting perspective. So, um, from a perspective of running a group, this is so. I found it, so I, I lived in Poland, and I moved to the Netherlands, and I moved to the US, and I came here. Every time point was really heartbreaking when you're moving, because you're leaving friends, you're leaving behind some kind of life you had there. You liked it more or less, depending on the place. And now, from a group leader perspective, I also have this like um, anger that I have this excellent people in the group, and we've got vision for how we're going to do research. And then they go, OK, in a year time, I want to start my faculty application, start my own group. And I go, oh, we could be doing such a great stuff together. And you're mm -hmm. going to go and be independent. And I'll have to collaborate with you instead. <laughs> no, but joke aside, you know, when you think about how disruptive it is to running a group, that you've got people and they are under pressure to move on to a different place rather than doing, keep on doing great work in, in your group. I actually felt that this was a little bit um, like unsettling for me. I found myself now on a, a slightly different angle of, of facing this sort of anxiety of people moving um, out of my group. And I mean, of course, I am more than supportive for uh, faculty applications, and I couldn't be more delighted. Um, and also looking back, I loved my all the places that I lived in, and, and the research culture was different, and I've learned so much, and I love the fact that we have super international group and everybody brings in something new to the table and it's not only about 
Um, you know how it, it, I mean it just translates onto everything how they think about research how they think about life about culture I think we all learn from each other how to interact with other humans just because we are such a multicultural environment so I am very conflicted on that topic I really don't know where I stand because on one hand I want to completely um, endorse um, travels and, 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 and international science. On the other hand, I'd like to protect the good people in my group. <laughs> um, I think that's a really interesting subject and I might just hijack it for a second uh, with the um, kind of diaspora organizations such as Polonium or maybe SRUK in mind. What do you think, maybe Rocio, to put you on the spot, what do you think the role of organizations such as ours should be in, in this? Uh, you said you are looking at your members because you're a membership organization. Uh, what else is there that we could be, we should be doing to support people as well as we can? Okay, so I believe that, um, I'm, and I'm talking about my own sure. SRUK because I understand that um, all diasporas um, societies, they work in very different ways and with very sometimes very different um, objectives. But from um, SRUK perspective, the way that we think that we can support our members in this sense is by being a lobbying force in Spain. And this is what we are doing. Um, so what we do is every chance we have and everyone that is like willing to listen to us. So we you just have met the king I saw on Twitter. Yes, we have met the king, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean he should not be able to make any change. <laughs> um, but yeah, so every time that we can we go and talk to uh, policymakers to just show how damaging and disruptive things are for the research community at the moment. Mm -hmm. What needs to be changed? What needs to be re what needs to remain as it is because it works. I mean, it's, it's, it's a messy system, but some stuff work. So uh, not everything needs to be, to, be, to be changed, but some things definitely needs to be changed. And we have such a massive um, um, knowledge pot from being in, in the UK, you know, and from being in other countries because we are um, also collaborating with all the other mm -hmm. Spanish diasporas in the, in the world. So we know, I mean, we can compare how the UK systems compare to the Australian system and how things are done in Japan and how things are done in Mexico. So we can just all come together and, and, and I'm gonna say advice, but it's really just lobby and say, look, these are the 10 things that need to change by yesterday, if you want to um, retain your talent, if you want to attract international talent, if you want to have a healthy research and innovation system that support your economy and that supports your society. Um, I think that that's the best way that we can support our members um, in the current system, in the current climate. It's not the most rewarding way because uh, we've been doing this for the past five years and as far as I'm concerned, nothing has uh, changed. But well, um, the political landscape in Spain is also kind of challenging. So um, I don't think that that's our fault. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would like to see us in a, a, I think that we are a political force. So we are not, obviously we don't endorse any political parties, but that doesn't mean that we are not political. So we want some policies to happen. We want some political changes to happen that makes it a political body. And I think that we have to capitalize on that and try to make those changes happen. Mm. It's, it's very interesting and I think from our couple of recent collaborations that we've had, we've also noticed how joining our forces, for example, as European diasporas coming together to have our voice heard even more, that has been an interesting trend I've seen. But I'm not in this panel to have opinions, so I'm just <laughs> going to ask you again uh, a bit more broadly. Do you think uh, researchers should become political, should be politicians, should be advising politicians? How do we get politicians on board? Should we just stay neutral? We had an uh, interesting presentation earlier today about um, using uh, research reports uh, 
to, for, to presenting them to policymakers how to do it and uh, examples of cases where that's been... Mm -hmm. if, if I return to my earlier political point about Poland, for example, I, I don't think it means being uh, particularly political on the issue itself, mm -hmm. on, on the way in which um, gay and lesbian people were presented in the recent election campaign in Poland, for example, or the way in which certain kinds of uh, xenophobia have been supported subtly, sometimes not subtly, by government, members of the government and the media are subservient to them. Um, you don't need to take a moral position on those issues. You can simply take a practical position. And I would encourage you to do it, those of you who are in contact with people of the Polish government, just to say, well, if this is your policy and you have domestic reasons for this policy, but these are the effects, potential effects, when it comes to the way that Poland will be perceived by the kinds of people that you want to build cooperation with, right? So to say that um, damage to internationalization of science is one potential, so this is just one example. The reason I think it's a good example is because it shows you don't need to adopt a position on the issue to say you are wrong um, to do this. You don't need to say that. You just need to say this is the consequence of these particular um, actions as we see it from where we, from where we are. Um, so I think that's one way uh, to approach it, which sounds like is what you're doing, right? It's about issues focused uh, and, and what the consequences are for your members. Um, um, I mean, should, should they become political? If, if, if politicians, if, if they feel like that, you, you could have um, invited Julian Harper, who actually was an MP here, and he graduated from Sanger. Um, but he would be a better place to answer this and what actually, what you can do when you're in, in the government. Um, I think, building on what you said, uh, what I do is, um, I feel like often when you talk sort of to um, non-academics, regular human beings who perhaps don't engage with newspapers or at least high quality newspapers to the level uh, a human being should um, and they are very prone to just being bombarded by uh, um, I don't know Facebook uh, social media or radio stations with um, you know catchy phrases and then they go around believing that Brexit's gonna solve the issue um, the way I've been engaging is actually saying what is like? I, I try not to state my opinions. I'm just gonna say what it's gonna do to science or what it's already doing, how uh, it's it will impact, for example, the um, access to new generation medicines, and and then it becomes personal because suddenly you know you say. Um, what imagine somebody you you know related to you gets cancer and now it turns out they, they will have to wait for a year for this new generation drug until it comes from Europe just across the channel to UK if we brexit and then it becomes like hmm well nobody told us that you know so it just like you can take your scientific knowledge and, and without stating opinions, just sort of engage politically. Um, and I think that actually uh, really triggers conversation rather than um, sort of throwing an, your own opinion at somebody and then you just become as like, oh, that academic and mm, I don't want to talk to them. Um, I think there's a point here also about um, system. So looking at the sort of political world and the scientific world, mm -hmm. I guess not being a scientist here is actually quite helpful for me. Um, and thinking about how much connections they really have with each other. It's something that we're aware of, something uh, we work on in my organization. We run something called an MP scientist pairing scheme, which Rossi will know well about, uh, know a lot about because they're doing something similar in Spain as well. So connecting MPs, um, civil servants and scientists, they spend a week with each other. Scientists spend a week in parliament understanding the uh, parliamentary process, taking part in a mock select committee and shadowing their MP and I think understanding what, uh, what an MP's daily life is like, what questions they're faced with, a sort of short term nature of a lot of what they have to do. And then um, it's flipped over the other way. So then the MP will spend time in the lab, or the civil servant will spend time in the lab and understand, again, a bit more about a scientific career and sort of questions that motivate scientists. And I think this is really important because I don't think you can assume that people just understand immediately the way another person's um, career, their life, their professional environment actually works. 
Um, and so I think that's one step. And I think something else, as you were, you were talking about the importance of uh, talking, you know, when we talk about things like clinical trials, we talk about things like regulation, and we talk about um, all of these things. I think that's one thing, but why is that important to the everyday life of the person you're speaking to? Why does your science matter to them? Um, and I think that's something uh, that we really have to keep in mind when we talk about, um, about big issues l like the ones you were talking about. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry for hijacking this bit. Um, if there's any more questions from the audience. Um, yeah, there's a few. Marta? Hi. Um, I didn't actually expect that there would be time for my questions, so I'm quite pleasantly surprised. <laughs> I wanted to go away from um, sort of mobility of researchers and go towards um, collaborations and global collaborations. So we had a really interesting workshop this morning um, on using open uh, science methods to aid collaborations and make it more systematic and more robust and quicker. And that was very, very fascinating. But something that we came across was um, kind of ethical difficulties with kind of collecting human data between different countries, where is it stored, who is the owner of the data, is there anything sort of being done in terms of policies at the moment to try and make this a bit more fluid? Well, I mentioned this uh, commission on genome editing, so I'll, I'll mention it again, but I think it's an interesting point you raise about the, um, and I, th I think it can also uh, focus on regulation as well. So look at the practice of science, not only um, the fact that scientific issues that we deal with are global, but the ways in which different countries approach these. Um, I don't know if I have a definitive answer for you in terms of, uh, you know, has something been decided on? There are some things that are looked at at a global level, but there's a lot of different cultural considerations to take into account um, with these things. There are many systems that are not regulatory um, they're not streamlined in terms of uh, you know, regulatory basis. Of course, if you're looking at the European Union, even then there are examples that come up um, where you have very different approaches to some areas across different member states, which are beyond the scientific, in a sense. So it's not really an answer, but it's more a comment. <laughs> I don't, I should, but I don't follow very closely the development um, in this respect. But I think at least in terms of genetics, there's really a lot of um, discussion and, and, and um, really efforts that bring together politicians and scientists and trying to think about how to, um, what, what mechanisms we should be putting in, in place. Um, this is a very high level answer and, and I just don't know what, what's the current state. I think it's still down to institutions, but there's really a extensive discussion and there's a global health alliance that is um, um, built of um, scientists and I think also some uh, potentially politicians are involved in it um, and, and really discussing what do we do in the era of uh, broadly available genomes and how do we treat that information and how do we share it and yeah, what do we do with samples and so on. Um, thank you. I'm afraid we will have to be wrapping up. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, we've got two more questions. If it's just for one panelist, maybe we can do a quick one, Michal. What do you think? Okay. And then we have a gentleman there. Great. Um, my name is Michael. Uh, I am from the Polonium Foundation, but I was also work in an Afrofic tank. I really like the discussion about the uh, about the science policy and about the communication between the scientists and researchers and policymakers. Let me share shortly my experience. I have been recently been to, to one conference on energy modeling and climate platform in, uh, in Brussels, and there has been a strong push from the, from the DG Energy, Climate and Trade on uh, using the scientific methods to support the, the DG, uh, well, free, free, the, the free DGs in the Brussels to support them with scientific background and scientific arguments for climate neutrality by 2050, so a policy objective. And there has not only been uh, activity from the, from the scientific side, but also a need and a strong push from the, from the DG uh, to get 
uh, scientifically proven results. So compare it some, to some extent to the, to the Polish background, it's barely possible or even impossible to be independent in, in these terms. So I'm really happy that along the, say, last four or six, six years, there has been some improvement in terms of science policy, but in but other in other in other areas, it's not impossible if, if you know if you don't have uh, independent funding or funders that are not committed to the government. So for this, you have to be independent. Okay, so if it was more of a comment, I guess um, I I'm really sure we're going to have to cut this short because we're already behind with timing but uh, just to wrap things up I'm going to have a very quick question to all of you if you had one wish considering all that we've been discussing to get today that you could uh, make you know one wish come true what would it be in terms of science is global all the collaborations everything I can't stop but say uh, revoke article 50 because that's going <laughs> to fix a lot of what we were <laughs> saying here <laughs> It's not my one wish, but I, I am thinking about more about decentralization as something desirable mm -hmm. and there being sort of... For, so it's important to me that there are really strong universities in Poland, for example, and not that the best Polish researchers come over here. I, I want to see the Agalonian University, University of Warsaw doing really well and, and to have sort of a broader um, spread of scientific excellence around Europe, for example, and not, not just Europe. So that's something I'm thinking more and more about. Thank you. Um, I guess that I would like to see um, certain governments um, understanding the importance and potentiality of having a healthy research and innovation landscape in their own countries. So they can have that in their political agenda, basically. I think for me, thinking about um, the organisation I work for, the sort of aims that it's been really driving at for over 350 years, for me, I just want to make sure that scientists know that they can pursue their opportunities wherever they want to and they feel that they have a system in which they can um, nurture their own interests and be able to really um, pursue them. Gosha, back to you, I'll or was it? My one no? wish. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you very much. It's been wonderful having you here. Can I, uh, you please, please join me in thanking the panelists for tonight.